Well, um, I think that there is going to be more to be said about robotic uh, gastrectomies in the, uh, in the future. So I'd like to uh, uh, go into Grand Rounds, and uh, I believe that we're connected uh, both with uh, Lower Manhattan Hospital as well as with uh, Carter. And uh, it's a pleasure to uh, uh, introduce uh, Tony Beninato, <coughs> our uh, administrative chief resident uh, for the uh, second annual Department of Surgery Historical Grand Rounds. No introduction for Tony is really necessary. Uh, she joined uh, the Department of Surgery uh, eight years ago for residency, and she spent two years uh, uh, in the laboratory of uh, doctors uh, Fay and Zarniga. And uh, she will go to uh, the University of California, San Francisco, for a fellowship in endocrine surgery. Um, this is the second uh, annual Department of Surgery Historical Grand Rounds. Uh, if you remember last year, uh, Barry Rich uh, uh, gave uh, a, a full Grand Rounds uh, uh, on the first uh, chair of surgery, Louis Atterbury Stimson. And uh, Tony is here to talk to us about the second and third uh, chair of surgery, Dr. Charles Gibson and Dr. George Hoyer. And I think this is going to be a part of a series of uh, uh, lectures every year uh, to uh, cover the uh, uh, most important uh, uh, individuals and faculty members of the past of uh, this department to give us a better appreciation and an in-depth appreciation of the contributions uh, to surgery uh, by this department. So without any further uh, delay, I'd like to invite uh, Tony to the podium and uh, give us the grand rounds. Uh, I have to say that uh, Tony has uh, I worked on these grand rounds for uh, uh, several weeks and probably months, uh, visited the historical archives up on the uh, uh, highest floor of this uh, hospital, and uh, I'm sure that uh, he's going to treat us to a, a very nice and iconographically rich grand rounds. Thank you very much, Tony. Good morning. Uh, thank you for attending our second annual historical grand rounds. Last year, we discussed the first chairman of the Department of Surgery, Louis Atterbury Stimson, who was responsible for forming the relationship between the New York Hospital and Cornell Medical College. Today, we will, we will be discussing the lives of the second and third chairman of the department, Charles Langdon Gibson, who served from 1918 to 1931, and George, George Julius Hoyer, who was chairman from 1932 to 1947. Charles Langdon Gibson was born May 5, 1864, in Boston, Massachusetts. He spent much time abroad as a young man and received most of his early education from private tutors in France. He went on to learn French fluently and gained an intimate knowledge of the French people and culture. His family had wanted him to attend Oxford University, but he rebelled, returned to the States, and finished his education at the Adams Academy in Quincy, Massachusetts, which is pictured in the upper left, and then received both, of his, both his undergraduate and medical degrees from Harvard University in 1886 and 1889. Following graduation, Dr. Gibson moved to New York and completed his internship at St. Luke's Hospital from 1890 to 1892. After completion of his internship, he had his first publication in Annals of Surgery, Operative Procedure in Advanced Age, based on a study of 65 cases age 70 or more. This was a case series of patients over the age of 70 who had undergone surgery, after which he noted that early mobilization of elderly patients is of cardinal importance, and on it depends often the recovery or death of old people. Following his internship, he returned to Europe to complete his training at clinics in Heidelberg, Vienna, and Breslau. He spent most of his time studying diseases of the stomach, namely severe gastric ulcer disease leading to gastric outlet obstruction, and he wrote several editorials on his experiences at these clinics and the various surgical methods employed abroad. <coughs> Dr. Gibson returned from Europe in 1900 and joined the staff at St. Luke's Hospital and was quickly advanced to full attending surgeon. In 1907, 
he joined the New York Hospital surgical staff full time and by 1913 was a full attending surgeon in charge of the Cornell division of the New York Hospital. This image shows the staff of the hospital with Dr. Gibson seated at the far right next to Lewis Atterbury Stimson. At the outbreak of World War I, Dr. Gibson organized relief efforts in France and Belgium and took a leave of absence to travel to Belgium and visit with Dr. Antoine Depage, a friend of his who was in charge of a Red Cross hospital that was not far from the front line. Gibson was impressed by the bravery of Dr. Depage in working so close to the trenches and wrote an article in the New York Hospital Bulletin, shown here detailing his visit. Upon his return to New York, Dr. Gibson organized efforts to obtain money and supplies for the hospital in Belgium, much of it from his personal funds. He was later recognized for this work at a ceremony in Brussels on December 22, 1920 by King Albert of Belgium. Dr. Gibson was decorated Commander of the Order of the Crown. This honor was given by the King to foreign citizens who provided support to Belgium during the war. Pictured here is the certificate given to Charles Gibson during this ceremony. Dr. Gibson returned to France in 1916 to accompany Dr. Depage, pictured here to the left of Gibson, on a visit to Dr. Alexis Carrel, winner of the 1912 Nobel Prize in Medicine. Dr. Carrel was devising a novel treatment of war wounds to attempt to improve infection rates. In the Carrel method of treating wounds, the wounds are debrided within 24 hours and filled with a large number of 16 French rubber tubes. Through these tubes, Dakin's solution was infused every two hours. Daily quantitative bacterial counts were obtained, and when these fell to zero for six days in a row, the tubes were removed and the wounds were sutured closed primarily. Dr. Gibson noted that these wounds heal in a manner that is simply indescribable. In 1916, the US government called upon large hospitals across the country to organize units of doctors and nurses to help treat the soldiers wounded in the war. Hospitals were organized into numbered units, given local training, and eventually these units were activated and sent into action. 238 hospitals across the country organized such units. The unit here at New York Hospital was base hospital number nine. In February 1916, Dr. Gibson helped organize Base Hospital No. 9. He was made a major in the Medical Corps of the Army in April 1917, and the hospital was mobilized in July. After a brief period of training on Governor's Island, the unit left New York on August 7, 1917, and sailed to France. The unit was stationed in Chateau Roux, France, and occupied recently constructed buildings that had been intended for use as an insane asylum. The hospital operated from September 15, 1917 until January 13, 1919, and treated over 15,000 sick and wounded Allied soldiers. Upon the sudden death of Lewis Atterbury Stimson in 1917, Charles Gibson returned to New York Hospital which at that time was located on 8 West 16th Street between 5th and 6th Avenues. He assumed the position of full professor and chairman of the Department of Surgery and left the supervision of Base Hospital No. 9 under control of his good friend, Dr. Eugene Poole. The unit returned to, to New York on April 27, 1919. Dr. Gibson's greatest contribution to Cornell was perhaps his development of one of the earliest surgical follow-up systems in the country, first instituted in 1913. Prior to then, patients were often discharged from the hospital after surgery and never seen again by their surgeons. Upon leaving the hospital, patients were given a card with a follow-up appointment for three months after the date of discharge. The patients returned to clinic on the assigned day and the surgeon marked their condition as excellent, satisfactory, or unsatisfactory. He published two further reviews detailing final results in the surgery of malignant disease, study of a 12-year follow-up, and finally, the educational value of the follow-up, 
a report of four, 14 years from the first surgical division of the New York Hospital. His reports of general surgical follow-up show that 95% of patients were returning for follow-up visit with a 4.6% operative mortality. Dr. Gibson also wrote about some of the new operative techniques, which unfortunately did not stand the test of time. He described end-to-end -end intestinal anastomosis via the invagination method, pictured here. He also invented the tongue depressor intestinal clamp using tongue depressors and rubber bands to prevent spillage from the cut end of intestine. Finally, there was the subserous cholecystectomy in which the gallbladder was shelled out of the serosa to prevent hemorrhage and bile leak from the liver. However, many of his publications were perhaps relevant for modern times. He advocated for early removal of small breast masses in women over 35 to prevent the development of cancer. Traditionally, surgery had not been done until the cancer was more advanced. He published a series of over 1,000 cases of hernia repair at New York Hospital and described a modified version of the Bassini repair where transplantation of the rectus muscle or sheath was performed in patients with direct hernias. This reinforced the floor of the inguinal canal, serving as a primitive mesh. He also published a technique for repairing large ventral hernias where relaxing incisions were made laterally to remove tension from the repair. Here are the before and after shots of one of his ventral hernia repairs. Dr. Gibson continued to publish frequently in Annals of Surgery, with 37 publications in that journal alone during his career. Dr. Charles Gibson was a member of many professional societies, including the American Surgical Association, of which he was treasurer from 1912 to 1915 and vice president from 1915 to 1916. He was also president of the New York Surgical Society in 1911. He was a member of the Society of Clinical Surgery, the International Surgical Association. He was an associate member of the Academy of Surgery in Paris and a corresponding member of the French Academy of Medicine. When the New York Hospital moved to the Upper East Side and Dr. George Hoyer was to be the new chairman, Dr. Gibson, at the age of 68, retired from active practice and was made professor emeritus and consulting surgeon to the New York Hospital. Ten years later, after a year-long stay as a patient in New York Hospital, he passed away on November 24, 1944. While Dr. Charles Gibson was perhaps not as well known as some of our other previous chairmen, he clearly was an accomplished surgeon and devoted to New York Hospital. We recognize his contributions to academic medicine and in serving our country during the First World War. And most of all, we have him to thank for the hours we spend in clinic each week seeing our patients for follow-up. Now I'm going to move on to his successor, Dr. George Hoyer. George Hoyer was born on February 6, 1882 in Madison, Wisconsin. He attended the University of Wisconsin in Madison from 1899 to 1903 and Johns Hopkins Medical School, from which he graduated in June 1907. It was while George Hoyer was a medical student that he had his first interaction with Dr. William S. Halstead, a longtime mentor of his, pictured here. Hoyer was asked to examine several surgical patients and noticed one that very clearly had a lower extremity sarcoma. He skipped this patient, having been confident in the diagnosis, and moved on to the others. At the end of his exam, Dr. Halstead asked if he had noted any limb length discrepancy in the patient with the sarcoma. George Hoyer was embarrassed as he had not fully examined the patient. He was quickly ushered off out of Dr. Halstead's office. Luckily for him, Dr. Halstead did not begrudge him this error for long. Dr. Hoyer graduated from Hopkins with honors in 1907 and was appointed as a surgical intern on Dr. Halstead's service. He's pictured here on the far right, and Dr. Halstead is seated in the middle. Dr. Hoyer spent his second year training in neurosurgery under Dr. Harvey Cushing. 
Eventually, he was appointed the 13th resident surgeon under Dr. Halstead and held this position from 1911 to 1914. During residency, he continued to perform both general and neurological surgery and published several papers that he co-authored with Dr. Cushing. When Dr. Cushing left Johns Hopkins for Peter Brent Brigham Hospital in 1912, Dr. Hoyer supervised the neurosurgical work. During this time, he developed a novel approach to pituitary tumors. He unfortunately did not receive adequate credit due to his inability to present the paper during his service in the First World War. The paper was presented instead by Dr. Walter Dandy, a resident who was three years his junior, who noted, when Dr. Hoyer was suddenly called to France last summer, he was prevented, prevented from publishing this operation, and its presentation will no doubt be deferred until the close of the war. With this in mind, Dr. Halstead thought that priority should no longer be risked and suggested that I presented the salient features of a new operation before this society. Dr. Dandy is often erroneously credited with the development of this technique. Following, following completion of his residency, Dr. Hoyer was appointed Associate Professor of Surgery at Johns Hopkins and Associate Surgeon at Johns Hopkins Hospital. Dr. Halstead selected Hoyer to complete an exchange program to Breslau, Poland to work with Dr. Herman Kuttner, who developed the peanut or Kittner dissector. Dr. Kuttner is seated at the far right in this image, and Dr. Hoyer is seated to his left. Unfortunately, his time at the Breslau Clinic was cut short at the breakout of World War I. In 1914, Dr. Hoyer was presented, uh, appointed chief surgeon for evacuation hospital number 10, and after a brief period of training, was deployed to France. While serving in France, he made over 500 individual note cards representing each patient he cared for. He also kept detailed personal handwritten accounts of all of his patients. Pictured is the inscription in one of his notebooks. Seen here is a list of the patients in his unit, the operation they had, how the wound was treated, and whether there were any complications. In his personal notebook, he kept much more detailed accounts of each patient, their wounds, their operations, and their hospital course. He included in his notes patient radiographs. Here is a chest x-ray from someone who suffered a bullet wound to the chest. He also included in his notebooks the results of autopsy studies that he often performed himself. During this time, he made contributions to the standardization of treatment of penetrating war wounds of the chest and published his findings in the Annals of Surgery. He corresponded with Dr. Halstead frequently during this time period and often complained that he had not been acknowledged for his hard work, to which Halstead replied, it must be a source of satisfaction that you have not been over-rewarded for your achievements. It is mortifying to receive undue recognition and undeserved advancement. Dr. Hoyer was discharged from the Army as a major, and upon his return home in 1919, was hoping to be appointed as Chief of Neurosurgery at Johns Hopkins. That position, unfortunately, had already been given away to Dr. Walter Dandy, the resident who had presented his neurosurgical work while he was away. Hoyer resumed his position at Johns Hopkins as Associate Professor, professor of Surgery. Two years later, the University of Cincinnati was seeking a new surgical chair, and wished to form a surgical residency such as that under Dr. Halstead. They first asked Walter, Walter Dandy, but when he refused, they asked Dr. Hoyer. Dr. Hoyer was conflicted about the proposition because he enjoyed being at Hopkins but had not received promotion while there. He left the decision up to Dr. Halstead, who replied that he had difficulty considering the Cincinnati proposition unselfishly. I've leaned on you for so long and your loyal and capable support has been such a delight to me that I can hardly even yet regard the situation fairly. To me, it seems a fine and rare opportunity aside for the, the possible handicap of which I am ignorant. Before accepting, you should stipulate that your voice must have great weight in the choosing of the faculty. 
Otherwise, you might have endless conflict with men whose views are antagonistic, who could surpass you in political intrigue. You operate so well and cover the operative field so completely that I feel the natural career for you is on the operating table, where surely you should be a teacher. Dr. Hoyer followed Halstead's advice and in 1922 became the first Christian R. Holmes Chair in Surgery at the University of Cincinnati. He brought with him several associates from Johns Hopkins to help build his department in a move that became known as the Hopkins Invasion. One of these men was Dr. Mott Reed, seen here to the far left with Dr. Hoyer on the right. Dr. Hoyer would eventually go on to marry Dr. Reed's sister while at Cincinnati. While his arrival was well received by the community, internally he faced the very problems of which, of which Halstead warned him. In a letter to Halstead, he wrote, I have watched some of the surgeons do simple things like hernias with utter amazement. Such things as control of hemorrhage, gentle handling of tissues, nice approximation of structures all seem to be unknown. Whether or not they will be able to grasp the difference between their ways and mine, I do not, of course, know as yet. Further dissent from the local faculty came when Hoyer insisted on improved surgical techniques that surgeons take histories from their patients and examine them. He also required that all surgical tissue be examined in the laboratory to confirm diagnosis, which was a novel concept at the time. A negative editorial in the local newspaper and a lawsuit against Hoyer for converting some of the ward spaces to private rooms further soured the atmosphere in Cincinnati. He continued to have support of the public, however, who noted that either the medical college will become a worthwhile institution or it will become a small provincial school with a narrow outlook and a very narrow field of usefulness. Johns Hopkins does not limit itself to Baltimore when it is looking for professors any more than Yale to New Haven or Harvard to Cambridge. If we are going to stick to a little Cincinnati policy at the medical college, we might as well give up the idea of a great medical school on a national scale in Cincinnati and look for progress in that direction to institutions elsewhere which operate on a broader plane. After nine years in Cincinnati, Dr. Hoyer was recruited by the Board of Governors of the New York Hospital to be the first chairman of surgery at the brand new New York Hospital Cornell Medical College Center that was to open on the Upper East Side. This saw the affiliation initiated by Lewis Atterbury Stimson in 1902 finally come true. The board particularly wanted Dr. Hoyer as they had a desire to instate residencies on all services. This made the residency at Cornell the, the fourth residency as it, of its kind in the country, following Halstead's at Johns Hopkins, Dr. Cushing's at Brigham, and that at Cincinnati that was formed by Dr. Hoyer. Dr. Hoyer was looking forward to the move from Cincinnati to New York. However, he wished to have assurance that his arrival would be more welcome than it was in, at Cincinnati. He consulted with his friend, Dr. Eugene Poole, who he had served with in World War I. Dr. Hoyer and Dr. Poole are seen together in the center of this picture taken during the war. Dr. Poole was part of the old guard of surgeons that included the former chairman, Dr. Charles Gibson. And he was also responsible for the abdominal suction tip that bears his name. Dr. Poole assured Hoyer that there would be no resistance to his arrival and the formation of a new residency program. The third version of the New York Hospital opened on September 1st, 1932, and is rumored to have been designed to resemble the Papal Palace in Avignon. This is the New York City skyline when it opened, and it was certainly imposing on the Upper East Side with very few buildings of similar size nearby. The census was initially small, and Dr. Hoyer wrote in his first annual review of the department that 1,765 operations were performed with a total mortality of 2.6%. Hoyer was disappointed with the volume and variety of cases, noting that over the course of the year, although the number of traumatic and emergency surgical conditions has steadily increased, we still lack sufficient material of this sort for teaching purposes. Whether this lack of special material is due to the location of the hospital or to a lack of an ambulance service, I am at present unable to say. However, he noted that the general care of surgical patients has been excellent. 
Dr. Hoyer continued to publish detailed annual reports during his years as chairman. He went into great detail about the numbers and types of procedures done and detailed descriptions of the mortalities and autopsy reports. Many patients, while having adequate surgical procedures for conditions such as appendicitis, continued to succumb to their disease from peritonitis left untreated because of the lack of antibiotics. During Dr. Hoyer's time here, many significant contributions to the hospital were made. His greatest contribution, however, was the formation of the fourth Halsteadian Surgical Residency. Before Hoyer's arrival, an intern completed two years of training after medical school and then often went into his own practice. Hoyer devised a structured pyramidal surgical training program with seven interns, three to four mid-level residents, and one or two senior residents. He believed strongly that it took five to six years to adequately train a surgeon. Candidates had to graduate from a class A medical school and could not be married, as the feeling was that you could only serve one master. <laughs> residents lived on the hospital on the 18th floor and ate their meals there. They often spent six consecutive months in the hospital without going outside. He structured his residency as follows. Interns spent six months on the ward, ward floors and six months in surgical pathology. Second year residents spent six months in the accident pavilion or emergency department and six months on urology performing mostly cystoscopies. Third year comprised of six months on the private floors and six months rotating through the general wards in the operating room and performing research. Fourth and fifth year was spent supervising interns and residents on the pavilions, performing a large number of operations and doing research. Finally, the fifth or sixth year resident was the hospital's resident surgeon who was responsible for the entire unit, answered to the chair of the department and operated on patients independently. In answer to concern by the staff that the residents did not have adequate supervision, Hoyer noted that, that in the academic year from 1935 to 1936, the resident staff performed over 3,000 operations with a 1.4% mortality, which was comparable to the safety profile from the senior staff. In 1935, Dr. Hoyer presented a paper at the American Surgical Society entitled Graduate Teaching of Surgery in University Clinics, which traced the spread of the Halsteadian School of Teaching throughout the country. Dr. Evarts Graham, one of the following members of the, Ameri the founding members of the American Board of Surgery, later noted that it was this speech that stimulated the founding of the board. With the breakout of the Second World War, Dr. Hoyer and the New York Hospital reorganized the New York Hospital unit of General Hospital Number no. 9 in which 43 members of the hospital, including 18 members of the surgical department, were trained in preparation for the war. The unit was activated by the government in July 1942 and was deployed to the South Pacific. By the end of 1942, the strain of the war on the hospital staff was evident, and Dr. Hoyer opened his annual report by stating, it has been a disturbed year. 93 surgeons affiliated with the hospital had gone to war, including Frank Glenn and Preston Wade, seen here during deployment. By the next year, the fatigue had, had affected the entire department, with increased difficulties due to inadequate staff, a shortage of nurses, and inferior and constantly changing personnel. Dr. Hoyer noted, it is becoming more evident as time goes on that there are limitations in human endurance in enthusiasm for patient care, teaching and research, and in mental stability, beyond which it is not wise to venture if we are to maintain a departmental group in condition of good health, high morale, and efficient, satisfactory work. All this, of course, we have long known, but the added experience should be valuable when readjustments come into question after the war. Dr. Hoyer attempted to boost morale in the department by typing up letters he had received from residents and staff working abroad and distributing them to the staff. Many of them, having been exposed abroad to surgeons without structured training, complimented Hoyer on the work he had done in New York. 
Major John Ogilvie of the 9th General Hospital wrote, the more I see of surgeons and their work in general, the more grateful and appreciative I am that I was able to go through the seven years on your service. Several surgeons also commented on the addition of penicillin while noting that nothing takes the place of adequate surgery. By 1946, there was a return to normalcy as the staff returned from the war. Hoyer noted that while there was some readjustment as people returned, he was optimistic that the department would continue to grow. He was correct in his predictions, as in 1946, there were over 8,000 operations done, which was the most since the opening of the Uptown New York Hospital. On July 1, 1947, George Hoyer retired as Chief of Surgery, having built an internationally respected surgical program at Cornell. A formal, formal dinner was held in his honor in New York, and the March 1948 issue of surgery was dedicated to him. He eventually gave up surgical practice and moved to rural Maryland with his wife to pursue his interest of raising cattle, duck hunting, and fishing. On December 15, 1950, he died of a myocardial infarction in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. George Hoyer contributed much to academic surgery. He had over 85 publications in various fields, including general, thoracic, and neurological surgery. His technique for closing the bronchial stump after pneumonectomy is still used today. He was a member of numerous surgical societies, including the American College of Surgeons, the American Surgical Association, the New York Surgical Society, and was the 16th president of the American Association of Thoracic Surgery. However, despite all of his accomplishments, his greatest was perhaps the development of his training programs and contributions to, to modern resident education. In Dr. Hoyer's own words, when I review my own professional life and its many satisfactions, the greatest is not the surgical operations I have performed or the thousands of patients I have cured, but the successful young men whose instruction and training I have directed. We have Dr. Hoyer to thank for the strong tradition of resident education we have here at New York Presbyterian Hospital, Weill Cornell Medical College. I'd like to thank Dr. Michalassi for this uh, project, which was actually quite interesting once I got involved with it, uh, and Karen Zippern and the, uh, the Cornell Medical Archive staff for their help with this project. Thank you. This was an excellent uh, historical grand rounds covering the second and the third uh, uh, chair of surgery in this uh, department. And I'm sure that if there are questions or comments, uh, you'll be able to uh, address them. Dr. Berry. Um, in my research, I did find a lot of correspondence between um, Dr. Hoyer and other surgeons around the country about writing his biography after he had died. And there was, you know, a mention here and there of Dr. Hoyer having operated on Dr. Halstead, which I would have liked to include, but didn't feel like there was enough details for me to go into it sufficiently. So, um, no, unfortunately, I didn't get a lot of insight about that. Are there any questions from uh, Lower Manhattan Hospital or, for that matter, from Qatar? Well, I think that this is uh, an extraordinary uh, uh, grand rounds. It really uh, underlines how the residency here started. I was uh, impressed by what you said, that this was the fourth residency started according to, I guess, the whole stadium principles of... Uh, uh, you know, five years and uh, a, a curriculum uh, uh, from the first to the to the fifth uh, to the fifth year, and uh, I'm delighted that we're doing this um, this series because really, uh, it for us, is a way to uh, understand uh, why we're here today, what we're doing today, that is based on uh, 
obviously a long past. Uh, past. I should remind all of you that uh, in 2018, it will be the 120th anniversary of the founding of this uh, department. And this department was one of a few departments that was uh, present and founded at the inception of the uh, medical school at that time, uh, uh, Cornell Medical College. So I think uh, we want to thank you again, Tony. I know that you put a lot of effort. Uh, you have recognized uh, Karen Zippern, our Director of Communication, but obviously you put a lot of effort in putting everything together and uh, giving us a very cogent and clear uh, rendition of these two uh, uh, past chairs. Thank you very much. Thank you. Very nice. Thank you. Congratulations. Thanks. Greg is already worried, you see that? Yeah. <laughs>